going to um, just introduce our presenters. We're going to talk a little bit, they're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what their focuses are. You know, I'll ask them some follow-up questions, and then we'll open it up to questions. So, um, Dr. Manisha Aurora, Dr. Sarah Evans um, have been involved in this work for quite a while. Um, and uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and talk a little bit about more specifically what you guys do. Go ahead. Just got in from. Where were you? You were in Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Yeah, just around. Nice. My name is Manish. I'm a professor and vice chair of environmental medicine and public health. Um, Ellen Menton mentioned exposomics. We have the country's first institute for exposomic research, and I direct the laboratory science for that. So you'll see uh, the two Dr. Rice there, they're the director and the founders of the institute. Um, I run a lab there where we develop new technology. And the focus has, for my work and now at the institute, has always been bringing this new science that measures holistically the environment, the social, the chemical, the physical, across the life course, but then take all of that new knowledge and make it applicable. Develop something that helps patients now. And it just, just you know, languish in the realm of academic publication, but it has a real impact on, on people today. Uh, and I'll talk more about it uh, after the introduction about how we have been on develop world-first technologies that are helping children with autism. We're working on conditions in later stages of life like ALS and the such. And, and so that, that's the mission of, uh, of what the Institute does, and that's personally my mission in my profession as well. Yeah. I'm Sarah Evans. Um, so I have a doctorate in neuroscience um, from Cornell, and um, I introduce that to sort of set the stage for how I got to where I am now, working in environmental health. Um, so I was working in a laboratory, studying cells and molecules um, and factors that help the brain develop. Um, and when I was doing my graduate work, I had my first child. And that was when I really started to think about um, all of the factors in the world um, and the environment around us that actually you know, determine whether we um, get sick or whether we stay healthy. Um, and so I discovered this program at Mount Sinai. At the time, it was the Children's Environmental Health Center, now Institute for Exposomics Research. Um, and I was able to go there and train alongside epidemiologists, um, pediatricians, other clinicians. We have a big occupational medicine program. Um, and really dive more into how uh, human health is impacted. And, um, Dr. Aurora mentioned you know, work that languishes in publications. Um, and I really felt like um, the work that we do in environmental health needed to get out to the public. Um, and so, and I think that's where, how we feel very passionately about that at the Institute for Exosomics Research. Um, and so I do research on how early life exposures impact child development, specifically related to brain development. Um, but I also work with a really fabulous team that includes Dr. Aurora, um, a team of pediatricians, a team of scientists, to make sure that the work that we're doing doesn't just stay inside the laboratory, doesn't languish there, um, doesn't wait for you know, every last publication to come out, but actually can be turned into um, actionable steps that people can take to improve their health and their, and their family's health. And we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, some of what I do, I actually spend a lot, I live in Fairfield <laughs> now, mm -hmm. and I have three girls now, um, and I spend a lot of time out in this community, um, messaging on things like artificial turf, um, use of pesticides, so we get a lot of community requests to come out um, and talk about what we know from the science, from the laboratories, um, and what you can actually do about it in your own community. Um, we also advocate for um, stronger policies, so we do a lot of that work in Connecticut, um, in Hartford to testify in support of um, legislation to reduce pesticide use, for example, um, in New York um, and in New Jersey. Um, so we're always trying to figure out how we can um, take the, the really incredible science, and which has become more and more complex um, and um, has given us a lot more information about environment. And so we're thinking about, um, just to build on that definition of what exposomics is, when I first came to the Children's Environmental Health Center, um, we were thinking about like single exposures at a time, um, specifically 
including during pregnancy and how that impacted child development. My um, area of expertise is really in endocrine disrupting chemicals like phthalates and BPA and things that are in plastics. Um, and now we've moved to look much more holistically at, uh, you know, it's not just one chemical at one time, but it's all the things in your environment, and that can include things like social stressors, um, the air that you breathe, what's in the water that you're drinking, what's in the foods that you eat. Um, so that's a really hard question. Um, Dr. Laura has developed amazing technologies. He's very humble about it, but maybe he'll share more. Uh, but he has really cutting edge technology to try to answer those questions. Um, and then our team, um, is working sort of on the translational side to make sure that people understand the work and that they can act on the work and that it can be used to promote safer practices and safer policies. So it's really um, just trying to get across, I think, how unique it is um, to have um, a research institute like this where you have clinicians and scientists um, and advocates all working alongside each other. I don't know if I that. So let's jump into just a few examples of the work that, that we are doing and, and how that, you know, along with Sarah and her team, and how this, what this whole journey looks like. So the one example that you know, I present often is, is that of autism, right? like Ellen said, that you know, it, it's increased tremendously the, the prevalence and you, you can't just say it's genetics. Because our genes don't change so quickly. The, the year I was born, it was one in five thousand. Now it's one in forty-four. And sure, we become better at finding it. We're better at detecting it. We're better at accepting it, and then saying, "Okay, you know, it doesn't carry that, you know, that fear of uh, the unknown diagnosis that like it did when, when I was a child." But still, that, that only accounts for about fifty percent of the increase. The remaining increase is a real one. So where is it coming from if our genes aren't changing them? It's coming from the non-genomic factors, the exposomic factors. So Sarah always does a very good job of describing you know, what these are, like they're social stressors. And we are a country of a lot of inequalities, right? We know that. We're also a country of great achievements, but those achievements don't spread easily through our population. So when you look at how autism is diagnosed, and who gets diagnosed early to get that intervention, you will see great disparity. So disparities also follow the same gradient as exposures. So if you live in a poor community, you live closer to a highway, you live closer to sources of emission, all these factors. Now when I was a student, my professors had the folly of that approach because none of us just gets exposed to one thing. We get exposed to everything all the time. So that's where the idea of setting up an exposomics institute came up. And I, I really give credit to both the Dr. Wrights for having that vision because it was a heavy lift to say we're going to work with professionals who traditionally don't work with each other. They use different methods, they don't speak the same jargon. And so let's bring in social scientists. I think Ross Wright studies a lot about early life stress so during pregnancy, during early childhood, the maternal stress how it impacts the child's health as well as the mother's health. Bob and I have been working together for 17 years. I, I remember when I first met him because it was a few weeks after I got engaged. I always joke with him that my relationship with him is like a marriage. <laughs> um, it's actually going better than my real marriage. <laughs> we, we fight less often, but... <laughs> and we, 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 we study on the chemical side of things all these different toxic and, and, and healthy chemicals that we get exposed to. And you bring it all together. So I said that I would give the example of, of autism and I sort of went off to give you the bigger picture. So bringing it back to the, the autism story. When I first came uh, to Sinai about uh, 2013, I was at Harvard before that and I was giving a, a lecture and, you know, the, the chair of the department at that time, Dr. Phil Landry, and he approached me and said, do you want to come to Sinai? I said, okay, let's talk about it. And that's when I was interested in neuroscience and neurological disorders, and I first heard of how autism is diagnosed. And it's diagnosed on a questionnaire. Mm -hmm. This shocked me because I was not from the neuroscience field. I'm not a psychologist. I trained as an oral maxillofacial surgeon, so I'm, I'm good with a scalpel and some of those fractures there. You know, after a motorbike accident, everything is fractured. I, that's where I, I used to be. I thought, 
said, how can this be? Because if I had diabetes and someone just filled out a question and said, yeah, you look like you have diabetes. <laughs> you have diabetes. I said, wow. Or someone had a lump in their throat and you said, well, you have thyroid cancer because I see that lump. And I said, no, hold on. That's a good start of the story. If I have a lump here, yeah, sure, I'm worried about thyroid cancer. It could be a bunch of other things. Maybe, you know, I just got hit on all the ways. I got that bagel stuck in there. <laughs> but in autism, it was the beginning, the middle, and the end of the story. Then you go to psychosis and skill, even before that, ADHD. Again, the whole story is just symptom based. Psychosis and schizophrenia. How do you know that you have schizophrenia? Because you had an episode of schizophrenia. And it goes throughout life. That we diagnose, like I'm working on ALS, we diagnose it so late. Mm -hmm. These are the facts that you can look up. On average, to get an ALS diagnosis, you have to go to three different clinical centers. It takes 18 months. You're often out of pocket $20,000, right? For some folks, when you only have five years left to live, that 18 months is a big chunk of life you have lived. All of these conditions have one thing in common, or well, two things in common. All the focus is on genetics. Right? And in autism, there's a hundred genes that we have found. But if I take a newborn baby and I say, here is a blood test, do all the genomics you can and tell me, is this child going to get autism? They still can't predict it. Because all the exposomic factors were missing. But I gave you a fact, right? It went from one in 5,000 to one in 44. So it can't just be the genes. I'm not saying genes are not important, but it can't just be that. So we started looking at exposomics. The other problem with these conditions was there was no testing, there was no biomarker. That's, that's a jargon term for saying like, when you get a blood test for diabetes. You're, you're looking for some signature, some, some molecular signature in your blood. There was no testing for that. So long story short, we started working on this and we set a very high bar for ourselves because unfortunately the, the, the commercial side of this thing has had spectacular failures. Sometimes failures because of just corrupt nature of, of, of you know, humans, like terrorists. It was such a spectacular failure that whenever you come up with a novel technology, there's so much skepticism around it. So the first thing we did was, we said we will develop this not using blood. And later on, I'll go into the technical details if, if you're interested why we use a non-blood biomark. We use single strand of hair. And I, I know you all see the irony in that a person without hair <laughs> <laughs> Back when I started, I had a full head of hair. Uh, I, I blame it completely on my wife because she said, I want to have a baby, and I said yes, and then and she had triplets. <laughs> and they just kept handing me babies. And, uh, I was like, I think they might have been more, I just walked away. After. <laughs> I can't deal with this. And soon after that, I started losing my hair, so it's, it's really on her. So we use a single strand of hair, and you know, it's God's gift that this little tissue that most of us just discard every day, we lose a few strands and we don't think about it, has so many wonderful properties. But during the pandemic, nobody wants to come into a hospital and give you a sample of blood for research. They're not sick. They're helping me. But here, you can put it in an envelope in your house and just ship it to me. And we have multinational studies. We did a study on newborn Japanese babies. Think about it. Japan is a monocultural society. Every child in my study is Japanese. They eat so much seafood from where we are. So different to this wonderful mix of people we had in New York. Every kind of ethnicity, different foods. We even did the study in twins in Sweden. Identical twins. One develops autism, one does not. Why? Because we're controlling for the genetics. They're genetically identical. And I'm saying it can't be genes, so I'm going to prove it. We did this study. And we said, you know, as early as one month of age, we can detect autism with a high level of certainty. And I mentioned terrorists, right? It was such a spectacular failure. I always say that I will undo all the mistakes they did. We publish all our work and we pay for it up front so anybody can just, who has access to the internet, gets the whole paper for free. You don't have to have a library membership. It's called open access. You're a taxpayer. You've already paid for it once. Why pay for it again? It's all open access. We wrote a book so that we could explain it or convey it in general terms. We worked with Sarah to put all that information out 
in a very simplified, easily accessible manner. Then we went to the FDA, the most, you know, the authority of the lab that is trusted with protecting our health, trusted with you know, reading out the, the junk science. And these are their words. This is not something that I'm just saying myself. They have a terminology for world-first technologies. They call it a breakthrough. And that these are exactly what you get a letter saying, yes, you have a breakthrough designation. So this is a world-first technology that can detect autism at birth. The reason it is important to detect it at birth because our brain, our children's brains, that's when they're developing. You know, children show language at the age of one year. But those are, that's the spoken language. They understand, they, they know their mother's voice even before birth. And so socialization, making eye contact. I remember my wife used to be breastfeeding with you know, two of them. I'd be giving breast milk to the third one. All three of them would be looking at her, even the one I was feeding. <laughs> I felt so jealous. I was, the first time I felt that, I, I wish I had breast milk. <laughs> in, 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 in a kind of creepy way. Right? But I really felt like these babies just don't see me. These babies don't see me. And rightfully so. An autistic child, they don't make that connection. They, they, they have to be trained to make that connection. And here's the sad reality of the most advanced country in the world. I was just in Europe. Every time I go to Europe, they say they're so jealous of American lives. I'm talking to big companies. I was at Novo Nordisk, a huge, huge European company. They have no shortage of money. They have shortage of ideas. Here's the sad reality that in the US, the average age of diagnosis of autism is four, and it has been four for the last 10 years. It just doesn't budge. And that's around New York, around Connecticut, around New Jersey, where you have resources. Go to the Midwest. I was, I'm talking to the sole center that, that is there in Mississippi. There's only one autism center. They say, can you please help us? Because people travel hours to come to us. Many of them don't have autism. They spend all this time and money, and we tell them, you gotta, yeah, your kid has something. It's not autism. Go somewhere else. And the journey starts again. Like, I, like we just discussed, your brain is forming right at birth, it's looking for the social cues, and we're diagnosing it at the age of four. I describe it in very simple terms, like putting the helmet on after your motorbike accident. It's not really going to help you. You have a critical window of opportunities the first year of life. So that's the whole mission here. Detect early, therapies exist. My wife is an occupational therapist, I know you're an occupational therapist, so speak to them. Therapies exist if they're delivered at the right time. If you deliver them too late, you've already fallen off that bike, you've already fractured your jaw, you can't, you can't fix it. And all of this, you know, you, you have said, I've mentioned the social disparity, the various exposures, but also something that we uniquely excel at at Mount Sinai is not just stopping and saying, this is a good definition of the problem, going that one step further, engaging the FDA, and saying that, look, this is a potential solution to the problem if you give us approval. And I was in Europe, and we have full approval in Europe. We are a global organization. I went to, uh, talking to folks in Israel, those of you who know about how the Israeli system works, they have a big health insurance organization called Maccabi. Maccabi is talking to us, saying, we want to roll it out. The Japanese government wants to roll it out. And both the doctor writes, this is the last one I made before I hand over to Sarah. I'm very proud of this fact, and I, I don't take any credit for it. When we first came to Sinai, we were ranked 27. We all came from Harvard. We were ranked 27th in the country. Nobody gets a prize for 27. Not even in our school system where everybody gets a prize. Nobody gets a prize for 27. This year, we are ranked number one by, by NIH standards. Mm -hmm. NIH says you are the number one environmental medicine in the department. It took us 10 years, 12 years to get here. That's lightning fast when you are 27th to get here. It's because of this vision that we will bring exposomics together and we will have a real impact on, on our community. I, I know I get excited, it's, it's just, this means so much to me that I keep going on, so I'll support myself if I can I'll, I'll, I'll make, make Yeah, I just wanted to, um, I think, build on some of what you said about um, utilizing exposomics towards treatment um, and identification of disease, early identification. Um, to also talk about like the preventive aspects um, where we can intervene before the exposures happen. 
Um, and one of the ways that we're trying to build out a lot of this work that's coming out of the labs um, is through training of medical professionals. So um, we have something that we're, that we're um, implementing in our clinics at Mount Sinai and pediatric clinic are environmental health screeners. So when you go to the physician, and I'm always asking people about this, and always thinking back to like my pregnancies and, and what, what information I received, um, or even going, taking my kids to the pediatrician now, it's actually very little, right? I think back, like, did I get a pamphlet about fish, maybe? Like, not eating, like, you know, which fish to avoid? And if I did, it was probably really confusing. Um, you know, that's still an area that I think there's a lot of confusion around. Um, what's safe to eat when I'm pregnant? Um, and so we, um, sort of on the preventive side, have been um, taking a lot of the work that Manish and others are doing in the clinic, or, or in the lab, to the clinic. Um, in the form of actually taking the time to screen particularly at-risk families um, for you know, what do you do at work, might you be bringing home um, unsafe exposures to your child on your clothes, for example, because of your occupation, um, what is your child eating and how, how much are they exercising, um, what types of products are you using in your home, um, are you, you know, using a lot of disinfectants, for example, which might um, affect airway development. Um, and all of that is based on what's coming out of the lab. And then also, like, what's your zip code? Um, are you in a neighborhood where you're exposed to a lot of violence and, and trauma? Um, we have um, one of the things that's really incredible um, in the labs now, and a lot of the hires that we've made from, from researchers are people who have mapping ability. So um, they can take um, GIS maps of all the air pollutants um, in the area where you live. They can go back in time and look at where you lived when you were pregnant, for example, um, and see what your exposures were. Or they can do the same thing with mapping um, things like neighborhood violence, um, water quality. Um, and so we can put together all that mapping information with information that a patient gives us to get a profile on what your risks might be, and then, most importantly, advise um, on what you can do. So we've developed a program called Prescriptions for Prevention. And we can provide, you know, I don't know if, if um, any of the links are available, um, but we can provide like, our social media and our websites where you can find all this information. Um, we have a prescription program. So based on how you screen in the clinic um, for your environmental exposures, your clinician can then give you a prescription um, for how to use safer cleaning products, for example, um, how to avoid lead or mold exposure, um, even how to avoid the impacts of um, the changing climate, um, which is a big area of research that, that we have. So we're working now to bring that out of, um, you know, not just Mount Sinai Pediatrics, we have a statewide network in New York, which has eight um, clinical academic medical centers where we train physicians to implement this kind of screening. Um, we're looking to expand into obstetrics, um, into pediatric oncology, that's a big area. Mm -hmm. um, I work with um, the New York State Cancer Consortium Environmental Action Team. We're working on revising the New York State Cancer Plan right now um, to incorporate more environment, more steps that New York State needs to take um, to create a safer environment and reduce cancer burdens um, in New York State. So, um, so I think you know that element of um, training clinicians to recognize and treat and prevent diseases of environmental origin, which is, um, you know, as Anish said, um, every disease that we see has some environmental component. There's essentially no disease that um, is strictly genetic or that's not impacted by your environmental exposures. Um, and so we are rapidly trying to get that information out to communities. Um, another way that I'll say, uh, sort of on the policy advocacy side that I wanted to mention is that there's increasing recognition, um, maybe we don't necessarily call it exposomics, um, but you might have heard of cumulative impacts. So a number of states are um, introducing legislation that looks at cumulative impacts. So this is super exciting. Um, I basically call it like exposomics legislation, where now they're saying, okay, if a if a um, company wants to cite that um, factory there or um, you know, that um, power plant in that community, they need to show, they need to look at all the other exposures that are happening in that community. What are the other sources of air pollution? Um, you know, how, what are the, what's the disease burden in this, in this community? And they need to prove that putting that power plant there won't have um, additional impacts or, or worse impacts on that community than it might. Um, so we're really seeing 
exposomics, even though it sounds like a new term, um, it's something that's being acted on and like, increasingly um, acknowledged, increasing awareness that all the things that you're supposed to do throughout your life um, you know, dictate your health and well-being. I'll just add a couple of examples <coughs> for the last point. When the water crisis happened in Flint, we were the first lab that they came to said, hey, you know, by the time we found out this was happening, signatures in blood would have disappeared because blood is constantly turning over. So your lead has a what we call a half-life, which just means that the concentration will reduce to half uh, in 30 days. So if you were exposed to something today in 30 days, that's half the signature in about two months, you don't see it anymore because it, which is so low. Now with our technology, we also use baby teeth and, and things like that. It's there forever. So now we are helping those pediatricians and the people who do the whistle on the Flint uh, uh, water crisis by collecting evidence. We can go back in time. And I'll describe this technology in a way. Uh, there was a huge excite battery plant in the, uh, southern Los Angeles. Uh, and they were, they came and set up this battery recycling plant in what looks like just a neighborhood. And there's just toxic amounts of lead being thrown out and, and the wind blows, all this dust goes. And most of the uh, communities there are very poor. They don't have a real advocacy component that they can't go and say, look, you know, we are major taxpayers and demand action. So again, you know, they clean it up blood levels come down, then they start doing that again. And of course, there's the corruption and all of these aspects, so again, we use this technology. And when we're doing this the world over, now, uh, you know, last month I was in Mexico, I'm going back in collaboration with, with the Danish group. You see just the most poor conditions in Mexico City, and if you're familiar with Mexico City, and someone says Santa Fe, it depends on which side of the railroad you're. Santa Fe is a super wealthy area if you live on top of the cliff. You can see you have this wonderful lifestyle that you would even struggle to have, at least I would struggle to have in Westchester, but these, you know, people with their suburbans and five security cards, all better suits than I can afford, <laughs> while walking around. But then down the hill is the other side of it. There's a massive river from it. What do you see in that old batteries, tires, mm -hmm. construction waste? What's right next to it? I've taken pictures. Uh, children's schools, children's playgrounds. Mm -hmm. And when we go there, but they know I'm, I'm an outsider, I'm there to do research. Uh, they give me a community elders to keep things safe. And this time, as we were walking, I saw a bullet on the ground. It was, it was a fire bullet, and we said, oh, okay, this is, you know. Then we went to one of our collaborators home, and he said, look what happened last week. Someone had hung a garbage bag upside down, tied a rope around and make it look like a dead body. I had pictures of it, I'm not going to show them to you. Very confronting. It was a warning. That you must stop working on these social issues because heavily can control them. You, you feel confronted. Mm -hmm. uh, we we started like, getting followed. I had to take shelter in a primary school because their primary school had massive metal doors with you know, barbed wire and broken glass. So we sat inside for half an hour just waiting for our community elder to negotiate safe passage. So some of this work is, you know, I always carry my American passport with me. That's my shield. You're messing with an American. I might not look like a traditional, you know, idea of an American. I'm not the Brad Pitt kind of American. <laughs> but it makes me so grateful that this place is home. I've lived in five countries. I've lived in countries that are wealthier, like Australia, and I live in the very rich Middle Eastern countries. I also lived in very poor parts of Africa during the Civil War and apartheid. My father was very dark skinned, my mother was very fair skinned, so you know, this was just risk for them to walk together. Community involvement here, the fact that we can have this conversation, is so, so important. That's why people from Flint call me and I'm saying, the answer has to be yes. I mean, there's no way I'm not helping you. You worry about money because these things cost later. Let's start. And now all this data I'm sending them, they're going to use that to get more and more, you know, uh, privileges for those that have been affected. Uh, we find that lead is transferred from a mother's body to the fetus, right? And we call this environmental debt, a vertical transmission of debt. Like right? you are born into debt because your parents couldn't pay off the bank. Right? There's some countries that do that. 
the only rare occasion that we do that here, most of the time, you know, it's your parents' dead. When it comes to environmental exposure, that's exactly what we do. So that's something that we are fighting for in the Flint community, in the Excite community, for those kids in Mexico. We're just finishing a clinical trial in Mexico. If that works, it will be the first preventive treatment that you can get in a box that just blocks the lead from entering your body, if it works. Right? It's taken us years, years of development in the lab and now to take it to that level. And the same thing will work in Flint, Michigan, in East Harlem, and those communities that have old peeling paint in their house, and you know, everywhere else. I'll just talk about one part of the technology that makes us unique. And it took us many years to develop, and it's been a real challenge for Sarah to, to convey that to, to the public because it is such a unique and different way of thinking. Because all of us are used to getting a blood test done. And if I ask somebody, have you had a blood test done, you say yes. If I were said, have you had a tooth test done or a hair test done, then probably not. About 17 years ago, we realized that there was a real disconnect in the way medical science is practiced. If I ask you to think of one thing in your body that is just static, the answer is you can't because nothing in your body is unchanging. Everything changes. Your bones change very slowly. They turn over, but something like your neurons, you know, a chain of firing at millisecond levels, so everything is moving. Yet we go to the doctor once a year, most likely, maybe six months, get a blood test, and so it's a snapshot. So why is that everything in our body is changing, but we only measure health in snapshots? I'm a big Springsteen fan, so sometimes I do this. I play little notes from different parts of any song. So he tell me what. what what song that is, even if you are Come, it's not possible. You couldn't even use AI because many of these notes are shared between thousands of other songs. But if you play the first 10 seconds of Born in the USA, everybody knows what that song is, right? Because snapshots don't reflect a dynamic system. A snapshot doesn't reflect what is happening in our body. Just like, you know, five one second snapshots of a movie doesn't let you understand what the storyline is. So the question became something that I was told as a PhD student, this is an impossible problem, you cannot solve this. And of course I was a young man, you tell me this is not a problem you can solve, so what am I going to do? It's like a red rag to a bull, I'm going to do this. I know how to do it. The question is this, you can all ask yourself this question. What was happening in your bodies a year ago? And I want it at a molecular level, not filling out some questionnaires, oh, okay, that was one year ago I stopped dairy or I started yoga, no. I wanted at a molecular level. And from then onwards, I wanted at every two hour snapshot. Right? It's like saying you took a blood sample every two hours and kept collecting it. The answer is no one in this room is doing that. And it's not safe to do it, so don't try it because you will eventually injure yourself or get an embolism and even worse. The question almost became one of time travel. Can we go back in time and start building this profile up? And I was really struggling with it. Two years went by my PhD, I didn't have a single data on a single graph, and I was really struggling. Till one day I saw a tree that had been cut down, you can look at your tables. <coughs> there are growth rings in a tree, and I was counting back, I still remember I counted to seven, and the tree ring was really garbled. I said, well, seven years ago, maybe there was a drought. This was in Australia, so this project won't do drought, so there was a big fire, this tree survived, but there was so much exposure, something happened. I said, hold well, on, this is the solution to the problem. If I can find growth rings in the human body, I can go back in time and start building them. Having trained in dentistry and oral visual facial surgery, I knew a little bit about teeth, and I got all teeth have growth rings in them, just like trees. And baby teeth actually start developing in the room, the second trimester. So every time a baby sheds a tooth or a baby tooth, the tooth fairy is actually getting the only fetal tissue you can give non-invasively after blood, after birth. So you're handing over fetal tissue. I collected baby teeth from all over the world, from Australia, from Mongolia, the US, Canada, Italy, I have teeth from a dozen different countries. When I moved to Sinai, I learned an important lesson. The research is one thing, but applying it to that patient, you know, that little Timmy on the subway who doesn't make eye contact, doesn't make friends, has to help that, that kid. 
you said, okay, where else can we find growth things? Because you know, I can't walk up to any of you and say, hand me a tooth. It's not going to happen, right? So we said, oh, there's growth things in here. So we started analyzing a bit of hair. It's technically really challenging. To analyze hair correctly, you have to cut it lengthwise. And that's the great thing about my team. I have a team of 55 scientists from 15 or 16 different nationalities. Finland, Greece, India, Sri Lanka, China, you name it, all over the world they come here. And we looked everywhere. We even looked in parts where you think, okay, the FBI is going to come knocking on my door. And they go like, oh, how do you get a fake passport? Well, you know that they slice the paper of the passport lengthwise to open it and stick, a, stick your picture in there. So they're putting all of this in, and I'm like, oh, this is going to come back to my thing. No one's going to believe it. Like, oh, I was just looking at how slides there. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now you look like, you know, as it is the DSA eager to grab you in the airport. So you're randomly selected. I said, I don't think that's how random distributions work, but you know, at least I get a bit of intimacy. After 17 years of marriage, you know, that's about the only place I think so. <laughs> you know my wife, so you can't tell <laughs> So we just struggled, and now we built a robot. And we found a Japanese company, because they're so good at robotics, they can automate everything. So if you ever come to the lab, we'll show you how to slice hair lengthwise. And it's not like Japanese hair, which is all the same, roughly the same kind of hair. Yeah. We have such a nice mix of hair, right? Mm -hmm. Curly hair, straight hair, thick hair, you know, really fine hair. If you have only, I think, I don't know, I've got anything in my hand. It's just so amazing that we get to be able to do this. And so, like Sarah was saying, we really invent difficult things that other people have said it cannot be done. The mapping that she was saying, one interesting part, I don't do this, my colleagues do this, is their innovation. We work with NASA. Every point in the US, twice a day, a satellite goes over us, from every part of the US. Uh, they call Aqua and Terra. Right? Yeah, these two satellites. And they pass a beam of light. So eventually, somewhere today, they will pass over us, pass a beam of light, and it bounces back, it measures how much of that light came back. As long as there are no clouds, if there's too much air pollution, like this, there's some smoke there, some of that light will get blocked. We figure out a way by measuring what the light comes back, we know very well what the air pollution is. So we don't have to go stick monitors everywhere because there are lots of monitors in the city, but there are no monitors out, out here because there are no tall buildings. So just like I'm going back in time with teeth and hair, my colleagues can go back in time for about more than 20 years, almost 30 years. You can go back 30 years. So if you give them your postcode from 30 years ago, they'll tell you if that one kilometer grid what was the air pollution twice a day, right? You bring all of this information together. Because why? Our health today is not determined by what we were exposed to today. That plays a part, but that's not it, right? So unlike our genes that are static, a conception you have your genes, that's what you are, genetically. Our exposome changes all the time. When people say, on one end you're studying, you know, newborn babies, even prenatal exposures, on the other end you're studying folks with ALS, this is it was very uncommon. You know, that's why we have geriatric medicine and pediatric medicine. These people don't talk to each other because, well, they are the other end of so spectrum, different things. And I say, no, I'm going to study both for the simple logic that we all know where babies come from. Where do old people come from? They come from babies, right? So if you want to understand what happens in older life, you have to study the beginning of life. So throughout this cumulative life history of environment, which is exposomics, we have built in this lifelong map using these very novel technologies that you know, we have invented. And we license them all. And the Japanese government, a very advanced country, comes to us for these technologies. We are helping with their national studies. We also help with Sweden, Finland, and now Denmark. So it, it, it's a real source of pride to me that we are helping at the world stage. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there again. And to add a couple of things to what you said, um, the, the tooth technology that has been developed by Manish and others in the laboratory is being utilized around the world. Um, so national cohorts of um, studies who you know, recruit women during pregnancy or even before and follow their children um, you know, into adolescence and adulthood in many cases, those studies are collecting teeth now and maybe hair, I don't know yet, 
pair as well. Um, so because of the work that started at Mount Sinai, we're going to have that really rich data um, from very diverse um, epidemiological cohorts around the world. Um, one of the things that I do on my side with community engagement is translate those findings um, for the very diverse um, individuals that are in those studies. So where we've collected all these teeth, we're going back to those um, study participants and also broader communities to say, this is what we're finding, this is what it means, this is what you can do about that. Sometimes that's an individual thing. Often, it's really um, a systemic or, or policy issue. And we're very careful um, when we go back to people and say, this was your exposure that you had during pregnancy, or this is the exposure that your child experienced, um, to not make that a stress-inducing experience, to not put all of the burden on that individual. And we work really hard on this in the clinic as well, um, to not shame anyone. Almost all, 100% of the time, it is not the individual's fault that they experience that exposure. Um, it's because we need safer practices and policies. So in the example of the XI battery plant, uh, the, they found that the children, because of the teeth, they saw that the children that were living in those communities had much higher levels of lead exposure um, prenatally and during childhood. Um, and they were able to say, you know, then, then people living several miles away, right? And they were able to say, this power plant is you know, polluting the soil, has polluted, has polluted the soil, um, you need to stop and you need to um, you know, compensate these families um, for the harms that they've experienced. So we could really make that correlation that you wouldn't have been able to go back in time to make. Um, you know, and similarly, we're working with the Mexico City families now um, who have very different types of exposures than um, we do here. Um, to, to work with that community to identify how can we, and they also have uh, much, you know, our regulations on lead in this country are very good. Um, and we test every child, you know, in many states we test every child multiple times for blood lead. Um, in Mexico City, they don't have that kind of policy. So while we're um, giving back information to families about, um, you know, not using lead glazed pottery is a major source there. Um, we're also working with that team um, to try to influence Mexico policy around lead exposure. So that's where um, you know, we can really drive a lot of influence, I think, from the technology that's, that's been developed and, and implemented. And then it goes beyond, um, you, know, you can measure and for disruptors, you can measure um, when a stressful life event occurred, because that makes a line in the tooth as well. Um, so it's not just things like heavy metals, it's, it's internal exposures, it's all sorts of external exposures that we can measure in, in teeth and in hair. On that point, there's a very nice article in the New York Times today about uh, American lead batteries being recycled in Mexico. If you look mm -hmm. at their lead level, it's just shocking. Like mm -hmm. If I had that level, I, I, I'd end up in the ER, you'd start having tremors and stuff, and there's zero protection there. So you, you can read that article in the New York Times. It's such an eye-opener that the level of the problem just across the border is so severe. Amazing. Um, so, um, I think, you know, I had some follow-up questions, but I think that I'm going to open it up to you guys um, to see whether you have questions. Um, I mean, we still have some time, but um, if anybody has any questions, otherwise, you know, I'm happy to... Go ahead. I, um, just curiosity in... Do you consider anything like with cell towers and screen time, is that considered... And different disruptors or <laughs> I can talk about screen time as a parent but so yeah. 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 I know you, you tell we each have three girls. Yeah. <laughs> Six girls um, so the the research on cell towers, so that is an aspect much harder to study than to study chemicals, for example, because it's very hard, you know, to measure we, we do biomonitoring, measure things that accumulate in the body. Exposure to non-ionizing radiation is, is much harder to capture. Um, I would say, you know, we, based on the current state of the science, we advise, um, you know, that you, one thing that's very good about that type of non-ionizing radiation is that it falls off very quickly. Um, so there are regulations on, like, for example, how close um, a cell tower can be to a school building, um, and they're, they take the position very high. So often you can't measure any radiation at ground level from those towers. 
from personal devices, um, you know, I think the data is still emerging, the studies are still ongoing. Um, it's hard to make a conclusive connection between um, that kind of, you know, non-ionizing radiation is like the radiation that comes from cell phones and cell towers compared to ionizing radiation which you get from an x-ray which we know um, is linked to cancer. Um, non-ionizing radiation, we don't, we don't have that kind of a link yet. Um, what we recommend um, in our uh, in community education is putting distance between yourself and your phone, between yourself and your wireless router, um, because you can, um, you can like, dramatically reduce exposures just by a little bit of distance. Um, they just don't follow. Uh, they, they don't travel long distances from the source. So that's not a totally conclusive answer. I apologize, but we do recommend you know taking those time those steps to just put distance between yourself and your. Router. Maybe something as simple as using earphones. If you, mm -hmm. you're, kind of, you're in a profession where you're always on the phone, even just using earphone, because then you're that much distance, that much distance is enough to dramatically reduce how much of that uh, that frequency you're exposed to. But why? Right. No, wire, yeah, wire. Because the wireless one again, you're it's the wireless. Right. They're not as fancy no, looking as the, the AirPods, but if you lose them, you don't feel as bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, just a quick question about the autism test. Is yes. it something that you envision uh, have being done, you know, at birth, the same way they do like a PKU test or something? Um, and what's the mechanism? By sure. Which Sure, so what we found was it's a, it's a panel of several elements that we put, the FDA says, you know, we don't want thousand different chemical signatures, some AI, one, but they're not, the, the science is there actually, but the FDA is not ready to evaluate it. <coughs> we can work with panels. So we made a panel, it uh, includes essential elements, includes some toxic exposures, but what we are looking at is how you metabolize those elements, because now we have a time signature, so in very simple terms, I mean, even when we present to the FDA, we say, look, this is the chemical hum of someone who does not develop autism. We call them neurotypical hum. This is the hum of someone who will develop autism, but we also test for other conditions, like this is the hum of someone who develops ADHD, or who develop a neuro, neuroatypical uh, development, uh, but it's not autism or ADHD, but they have something that we just can't identify yet. So we, we show them all these different hums, there are statistical methods to show how accurate we are. Uh, so, so that's what the panel includes. It includes biochemical signatures, essential elements, toxic elements. And to the one point you made, that's exactly the vision. That just uh, every baby in America when they're born, we prick their heels, we collect that little blood spot. But here's the thing. All the genetic tests, they test barely detect 1% of conditions that we are affected by. With the hair test, we're already at 10%. Autism affects about 3%, ADHD about another 6 7%, just those two conditions. One day, every newborn baby, within the first six months, some babies don't have hair at birth, we just need one strand of hair, we only need one centimeter. So it's a tiny amount of hair that we need. That's the other reason we're working with the Japanese. Everything has to be automated so that one day we can do a million tests a year without breaking a sweat. <clears throat> have you found that there have been many communities that have successfully banned pesticides on town properties? There's an increasing number. Um, somewhere I think you can find a, a whole list. Um, we've worked with some locally, even um, recently we've um, advised, I want to say, like Darien, Sanford, Norwalk, they've all come to us looking to pass restrictions. Um, you can't most states, including Connecticut, um, you cannot force residents, you can't tell residents that they can't use pesticides on their property, um, but you can pass like a municipal ordinance to um, limit the application of pesticides on town property. Um, we successfully passed that in New York City and we supported legislation um, in Philadelphia as well. So even large cities are able to do it now. So in New York City, um, you cannot apply any synthetic pesticides on any city city property, um, which is huge. So if New York City can do it, then other municipalities can. But that's something that um, we've worked closely with Beyond Pesticides. I don't know if anyone knows. Beyond Pesticides is an incredible organization. Um, we've worked with them, we're working with them currently in New York City to make sure that that law is implemented and that all the parks follow that. Um, so yes, there's an increasing number, and I think as um, communities show that they can do it and still maintain beautiful properties, Greenwich has done it, Greenwich doesn't use any 
for many years now, I think, granted to not use synthetic pesticides on their town properties, um, and they're able to maintain beautiful golf courses. Golf courses are always an exception, are always an exception. So there are only a few, that, as far as I know, there are only a few golf courses like in the world that don't use pesticides. So these the municipalities banned it everywhere but the golf courses. They always bring okay. exemptions for mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's just And that's really a problem. And golf. we've advocated um, to limit the use on, on golf courses. But uh, Martha's Vineyard has done it successfully. And I think there's a golf course in Scotland um, that does it. Um, but they're really few and far between, um, which is frustrating. And they use a very large um, number of um, like fungicide pesticides, which are highly toxic. Um, organophosphate pesticides, which we've known for a long time, um, are toxic to the nervous system. Um, so if you all you know, ha have influence at golf courses or know anyone who does, it's really an area to, um, to go after that's been very difficult. And a lot of times municipalities, you know, they want to get through the restrictions and so ultimately, you know, end up settling for, okay, we'll let the golf courses slide. But they're definitely a big source of pesticides. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, I have about a thousand questions, but I'm going to keep it to two. <laughs> um, and for either of you, one is I'm wondering if in any of your research you factor in um, the prevalence of reproductive assistance technologies, IVF, ICSI, all of these things, because since the past 30 years, so many kids are born through these technologies, and if that has any factor in what you're doing. And then also, I just, so when you look at the, the hair as if it were the rings of a tree, I'm, think, I'm, I'm not gonna say this very well, I hope you can un understand what I'm asking, you're, you're finding out what the baby is born with, what this baby is now being born, and this is the story we can read. But what about those, the factors as the baby grows? In other words, my kids were born in Manhattan. <laughs> you know, my daughter was a baby when 9-11 happened. We were far away from it, but nonetheless, in Manhattan. And they ate Lunchables. You know, I mean, what, what? <laughs> all the mistakes so <laughs> the IVF question and then also the what after the baby kind sure. of question yeah so first the IVF thing so from the autism and the neuroscience part we don't see any huge increase in the risk of autism and related disorders like ADHD and such in IVF babies versus babies where there was no reproductive system However, we do play a role in there because, and you can look this up, there's a very interesting article in the Washington Post about a year ago, it's called The Children of Donor and There's a Number. Oh, Autism has a heritable component. That means it passes from one generation to the other. There's this one man who gave, made a bunch of sperm donations at sperm banks and it resulted in many pregnancies. And a dozen of those children have had autism. Mm. So what we want to do is target Sperm banks where you check for infectious diseases, we might as well collect a strand of hair and check whether you're carrying the risk of all of these conditions that where we don't identify them genetically, mm -hmm. but there is a heritable component. Mm -hmm. so yes, we will play a part uh, in that. But it, 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 you know, for IVF induced pregnancies, we don't see any spectacular increase in uh, neurodevelopmental disorders. The only time we do see it is in a situation where one of the donors had a history of um, Sorry, what was your second question? And the second question was about uh, well, what the baby's exposed exactly, to as it grows. Exactly. So the whole purpose is to change that trajectory. Yes, you have the risk factor for autism, right? I keep running into some very prominent families. They've, they've invested in this technology. Uh, one I can, I can talk to you about, he started this company called Farmers Business Network. It's like the Amazon of the farming group. Hugely successful company, he's very, a very nice person. And his son had, had autism, but for some reason, the family just sensed that there was something. There was no testing done. He started building intervention. When you meet the boy, you wouldn't know that the child has autism. Because it was detected very early, and the mom just said, look, he doesn't look at me. You have another child, the child will look at me when I was breastfeeding, mm -hmm. something is going on. Just based on that, they started. There's still some social challenges. He struggles to main, 
maintain friends, but the problems are not those of autism. Autism, they are the things that often travel with autism, like anxiety, some sort of mm -hmm. self-esteem issues. Now that we can detect it early, objectively, across the board, we can change those trajectories because the sad reality of the autism story is that treatment exists. We just deliver it too late for it to have an impact. We've done studies that if you deliver this eight-week packet of therapy early in life, even after 10 years, those kids are doing better. So it's not like you have to be enrolled continuously in therapy. So I'm you know, banging my head against this wall of insurance companies that say, well, what's the value-based proposition? Which means, does it save us money? Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, yes, absolutely. If you don't pay for this test and we don't deliver therapy early, you're going to be on the hook for therapy for the rest of the child's life, right. as long as they're insured with you. So either you can deliver eight weeks of therapy or you can deliver 18 years of therapy. The other reality is that 18 years of therapy has far less impact than just this early intervention. So absolutely, we are seeing what the child's risk factor are, but that doesn't determine what their trajectory is. In fact, the idea is to change that trajectory, push it as much as possible towards the, the healthier, healthier options. I was just going to touch on you know concerns about those postnatal exposures and thinking you know we hear that a lot like and I've I've, you know, I've done the same you know send my kid something or used a certain product or what have you. Um, one thing that I would say is that many of the chemicals um, that are present in our daily lives and our daily products leave the body pretty quickly. So yes, expo you know continuous exposures, particularly during times when your body is developing or changing. Um, can have an impact, but we can also change that really quickly. So, you know, sort of like all hope is not lost. You may have seen studies um, where they swap out conventional produce for um, organic produce or swap out different types of products and you know, products that contain a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals. And within just a few days, you can actually see those chemicals leaving the body and reducing the body. So, some things stay around. Lead tends to stay around in deposit and bone, and some particularly older generations of pesticides. and particularly toxic chemicals build up in the body. We, we have sort of moved away from some of those chemicals that build up in the body towards a lot of chemicals that leave the body more quickly. So when you make small changes, um, you can actually change your trajectory fairly quickly as well. I mean, one of the things that we really want to see, and we do see more of it because of research and because of market pressure, um, is that those chemicals come out of the products anyway. We just have safer products so that it's not up to all of us to make the choices, maybe spend more money on more expensive products to reduce exposures. Um, but the good thing is we, there are little things that we can do. Okay. Um, I wanted to follow up on, on um, Allison's question a little bit. You, you said that like with autism, you can test and look at I think, how the person is metabolizing some of these things. So is that the same with other neurological conditions? Like you mentioned ALS and ADHD. And if so, what are those common threads and how do you connect it to Sarah's expression of the work of, you know, really getting ahead of it of the prevention? Like what are those things? Because we tend to think like, you know, ALS runs in, you know, someone's family, therefore their, you know, genetic predisposition predisposition is higher, but if we believe in that, the genetics, like, what are those things we can tune and turn down? Yeah. Sure, that, sure. So, so one thing about ALS is that its heritability is actually very low. So 90% so yeah. of ALS cases are not, are not genetically ordained because mm -hmm. we have never identified. There, there is familial ALS, which starts earlier in life, and there are a couple of genes that have been identified, but that's like, you know, honestly about 5% of ALS. Yeah. What we find, what is really surprising, and we are still learning about it, and it, it really, it surprised us when we started analyzing here from kids and teenagers and, and older adults, is that the human body throughout evolution has determined, has developed these few set pathways where it deals with all these toxic exposures, including social stress, as well as chemical exposures. And then it handles them in a certain way, but it's, it's and I'll give you some very simple analogies from different fields so that I can convey the, the complexity of the science. A part of it is when it happens. If it happens very early in life, you're, you're going towards a neurodevelopmental disorder because that's when your brain is developed. Whereas if it happens later in life, your architecture is already set and you're 
you know, you're, you're developing things that are degenerated. So it's like if the blueprint of the building is, is, is flawed, then your whole structure is flawed, right? But however, if the maintenance is flawed, then things are falling apart, but the original architecture was... Yeah, it's okay. But the idea is very similar at least. So the analogy that I'll give you is this. It sometimes seems overwhelming when you read that there's 100,000 high production chemicals. How are we going to legislate and deal with all of them? And that was one of the problems we faced in the science side. How do you measure all these things and you know, analyze the data? Again, you know, most of my inspiration comes from just the simplest things in life, like, a, like an apple falling. Right? We just ignore these things, but I've learned over time that the solutions are all in front of us. Right? So I was looking at someone making pasta. Right? Seems like a completely disconnected thing, right? If you take a big bolus of dough, you think, oh my god, the patterns in that, even a supercomputer couldn't solve, solve this. But when does it become a completely solvable problem? As soon as you pass it through those channels and you're telling that it's always going to come out like those 10 little tubes, right? So this complex input becomes a very simple problem that a middle schooler will solve and then, yeah, it's going to look like these tubes, there'll be 10 of them every time. That's how our body functions. It takes in all of these complex inputs, there's about 10 to 20 different pathways that all of this passes through. And that suddenly becomes a very useful finding because now you can go to pharma companies and say, these pathways, I know you have a bunch of drugs that failed in so many clinical trials, can we repurpose them? Mm. This trial I'm running in Mexico, it's <coughs> purpose probiotic. It's just a little white powder that you spread on your cereal and eat it once a day. It's just a probiotic that in Europe you could hide at the pharmacy. It was completely like going out of business because people said, ah, oh, there's some Japanese ones that you can eat with like a sweet little milk that you drink and they're very popular in some countries. The Japanese especially drink a lot of culture like yogurt. It's kind mm -hmm. of like that. Suddenly you find that, oh, all these pathways, they, they combine and it is actually, I'm very hopeful that it will block lead exposure. Suddenly it's reducing your risk of autism, right? Because we can identify those pathways. And yes, there are common pathways that will increase your risk of autism and ALS and we are constantly building this map. In fact, what really surprised me that there are common pathways that increase your risk of autism and also of GI disorders, like inflammatory bowel disease. Now, if you go to a GI doctor, especially an older generation GI doctor, and start asking about autism, they would not know anything. Completely separate fields. But I bet you if you go to an autism clinic and talk about GI, they'll say, yeah, about half our patients have GI symptoms. There's a GI component too. So when we found this, we said, oh, of course, we should have known this, but sometimes the data has to find you before you make the connection. So absolutely, that's the idea. That we don't start handing people like a bunch of pills, but it's through these common pathways that we bolster. Uh, so, 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 it's just our metabolism better fight off these conditions. There's a question. Oh, yeah. I have a few questions, but you talk about the microbiome and the vagus nerve that goes up the brain and stuff. Um, I have two questions. One um, is, I mean, I haven't had chemicals on my lawn in forever. I have so many different weeds, but they're green, so that's okay. Just cut them really short and then nobody goes. <laughs> well, not only that, the uh, woodchucks like the clover, so it keeps them away from my other flowers. I grew up in a desert, so when I talk about <laughs> people complaining about green stuff growing out of the ground, like, what's the problem? <laughs> Says that um, the spray is uh, safe. Yeah, we need to send it to me or Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So there aren't safe pesticides and weed killers, are there? So uh, Alex, Sarah would know more. I'll just give you my point of view. When you look at some facts, in America we use per square meter. I think it's 10 times or 100 times more pesticide in residential area than in farm, on farmland, right? So for me, what's the point? Like, what are we trying to achieve there? Right? I'm quite happy that, like you, my garden is doing its own thing. I mow it really short, and it looks just as fine. My kids play it, and I have zero anxiety, yeah. and my kids are playing in the grass. So why swap a uh, slight change in aesthetics, which is very personal, for some real anxiety that your kids are getting exposed He's to. Not I'm the one who <laughs> 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 You need to read some of the stuff that's said. The, the other question, I'll, I'll talk to you. 
But the other question is, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, they were analyzing hair for heavy metals, and they were talking about chelation therapy that was, I mean, this is, you know, hippie yeah, yeah. years. I, 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 know, I know that work, but I, I, chelation therapy is very severe. It, it's very acute, like those, you, the New York Times article that you read, like some of those battery recycling folks, they have lead levels of 50 micrograms per deciliter. Our, you know, the pediatrician is looking for two. Mm -hmm. Anything above two, we're like, oh, this kid is some sort, so let's start talking. They level at 50. Mm -hmm. They're having seizures and stuff, things like that. Then you look at it. The chelation therapy is actually has a huge number of side effects. Because mm -hmm. it'll suck out a lot of calcium. We did these clinical trials where the kids on the chelation therapy actually came out worse in their year development. But they were, had just had low level of exposure. So chelation therapy is one of the last resort. You're trying to save someone's life kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And the hair testing for metals, there's a lot of jack literature on that. Mm -hmm. So we have to be very careful. So don't start sending your hair to just anybody. <laughs> it, it requires very, like, like I said, you know, we spent 17 years developing it. We wouldn't have done that if it already existed. So there's a lot of concerns about these labs that open up and you need to kind of analyze your hair. Most of that is just contamination. Remember, your hair is exposed to all sorts of, it's, it's outside your body. All the time it's exposed. That's why we slice it lengthwise, because all the good information is inside. Yes. And you know you can't get rid of some of the toxic, uh, those metals from your hair, because if you look at your hair, it's like a barbed wire. It's like a snake skin. So if you look at the scales on it, Inside the scale, something gets trapped, you can't wash it out. So you measure a lot of external exposure in your head, not necessarily what's going on in your body. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on Claudia's question. Uh, so with some, I, I, the work you're doing is amazing, and it's very interesting. Thank you. Um, but with some of the autoimmune diseases, are you working with, you mentioned pollutants and chemicals and all that stuff, are you working with viruses as an exposure? Because um, it's like sometimes you read with an autoimmune disease, oh, you know, it's a, they have a predetermined, predisposed genetics and, you know, and then they get this child with, you know, virus that is something quite common. <coughs> that, and I'm just, I have questions around that and, and then, the second part to that question is, like within ALS and our autoimmune disease, you said it can take 18 months, and we all know that these things take a very long time for diet. So what are the new ways of diagnosing these types of autoimmune diseases, and are you doing work with that? Sure. So in, in a way, yes. And again, we sort of broke that problem down to where can it become a tractable pattern, right? And we thought, OK, our body you know, reacts to its own uh, stimuli in a certain few number of ways, there's oxidative stress, there's inflammation. And so we do absolutely study inflammation. And what we find is that it's not necessarily what you're exposed to, but what you react, how strongly you react. And you saw this, right? COVID has a singular origin, right? And you know, I had COVID twice, it was a bad COVID. My dad got COVID, he actually passed away from COVID. He just, uh, you know, genetically, we are very similar, but of course, it's the age factor. So it's not really what you're exposed to, it's how strongly you react. Mm -hmm. So a key component of the exposome is biological response. That's what makes us unique. Even identical twins will react differently to the same exposure. So when does that, you know, that, that, where does that biological response exist? And again, even in a traditional textbook, we will see that there's only a few ways that we react. Inflammation is a key one, right? So often you hear these stories about my child got a shot and they're suddenly got a high fever and now their brain is like, you know, those, those kind of mm -hmm. stories. Inflammation is something that connects autism with GI disorders. And when you think about it, say, of course, in IBD, a lot of symptoms, the I actually stands for inflammatory, mm -hmm. right? And in autism, a lot of kids are having this. In fact, we found in identical twins, in the third trimester, there's a huge sudden spike in inflammation in the kids that go on to develop autism. So right from the early days, there's this kid who sort of, you know, primed to react very strongly. You have a stimulus, and they suddenly, the, the physiology becomes very different. The same is true for autoimmune disorders. The same stimuli is causing you to suddenly, you know, react in a very strong way because it's, you're, you're hyper -inflamed. Same thing happened in COVID, the cytokine storm. What does that mean? It just means you're going to get so inflamed in your lungs that you're going to struggle to breathe. So find these common pathways. 
that hopefully can solve multiple problems. To be perfectly honest, it's a heavier lift there because you know we have finite financial resources, so we have to focus them. I always say that you can't run in 10 different directions and take one step in, in 10 different directions. You need to reach the finish line in, in a few of them. So you prove your idea. So autism and ALS, that's where we're engaging the FDA, ADHD, conditions like that. And we have a big now interest in allergies and you know, food response and GI disorders. That's where we've taken multiple steps and are closer to the finish line. In areas like this, we have what we call proof of concept studies. So we can say, yeah, we think this will work, but again, we have finite, you know, um, financial resources to, to, to make it happen. One more. Can we take one more question? Or no. Oh, you okay. I mean, I think we're okay. Uh, it's great. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. Um, this may be about face, but I'm more interested in what it is that you're measuring in the teeth and the hair. Um, to use the rim of the tree analogy, are you looking for just a sign of disruption at a particular developmental phase, or do the disruptions look differently based on which environmental factors? And then how does it look with a chronic exposure, i.e., the course of economic trauma exposure? I think I'll take you through the actual steps in a very simple way. That, that way, you have a clear picture of, of what we do. So imagine if these, you know, these planks were different growth things because kind of they do look like growth. We have to build a laser because these things are microscopic. So the laser goes and fires a hole. That's what lasers do. They just blast a little hole. It's a hole like we but I, I work with nuclear physicists. I've been to like synchrotrons, those things, you know, those are like that's where the bomb was developed outside Chicago at the Argonne National Lab. <coughs> a lot of physics goes into this. Whatever comes out of that hole, we pump it into very sensitive detectors, and it can measure thousands of molecular signatures. It's not just metals. I talk a lot about lead and zinc and things like that. It measures endocrine disrupting compounds, whether you're exposed to pesticides. It will also measure things that your body is built up of, what I call structural compounds, like lipids and amino acids. It will measure molecules that, that help the inflammatory process. So these molecules like arachidonic acid, it's present in breast milk and things like that, but also plays a key part in regulating your inflammation. That's one of the key tenets of exposomics, that we don't look under the lamppost. We measure as much as we can in a data-driven approach. So just because my PhD was on lead, I don't have to spend the rest of my life studying lead. I just look at all this data. So now you have a bunch of data. What sets us apart from genomics is that genomics measures many, many things. But we measure many, many things at many, many times. So at each hole, you know, and I make, I might make a thousand such sequential measurements at a thousand time points. I have tens of thousands of signatures. It's a huge amount of data. So what, what do we do with this? How do we say, oh, we use AI. We use very advanced AI. And what it tells us is, okay, I'm going to take all of this and form a pattern. You know. It's of no community relevant, but one of my claims to like something that I feel very proud of is we built a pattern that lasted 15 years. It's a 15-year pattern of human metabolism. No one's ever achieved that. No major journal will publish it because they said like this is just a nerdy, you know, self-satisfying exercise. But all the mathematicians online love it. They say, wow, you achieved something that we had predicted because they were trying to do this with weather. If we can barely predict the weather a week in advance, forget 15 years. And I said, but human physiology. You can do 15 years ahead of time. So it forms these patterns. And in very simple terms, it's just pattern recognition. Just like your Tesla is saying, oh, that looks like a motor motorcycle, right? But if you're driving one of those, you know, those delivery motorbikes that has an engine and slightly big wheels, if you carefully look, the Tesla will keep switching between a motorbike and a motorcycle. It's getting confused between the patterns, right? But it still says, oh, it's a two-wheel, two. That's exactly what we do, except we don't work with pictures. We're more like chat GPT. We work with sequential data, like numbers. Chat GPT works with letters and language. We work with numbers. And then it says, this pattern is an autism pattern. And it's no different to your Tesla saying, oh, that's a big truck, or oh, that's a tiny car, or oh, that's a bicycle. So it's, it's the same idea. But the key to this was the time component. So when I give talks to, again, communities of physics and mathematics, I say, we were wrong about one thing. We, we thought, Mechanism, right? What doctors call the cause of disease is a molecular vacuum. Time is the mechanism. 
this whole thing was lost in time and nobody had ever thought, oh, I need to listen to the, at least the first 10 seconds of Born in the USA. It was, oh, that's a Springsteen song, that's autism. Mm -hmm. and that's the key discovery here, the, the time damage. So are there two branches to the research then? Because this sounds more predictive. So you're looking yes. at the pattern for prediction for autism, Alzheimer's, yes. ALS. Yes. But then are you also studying which factors create that predictive text? Yes. Actually, there are three branches. The, the, the first one has two sub-branches. So you're going to get autism, but what kind of autism, right? Mm -hmm. so there's a whole spectrum. So one of the things I really want to solve, because I met family, it's super traumatic, is regressive autism. When your child is actually developing, they have some issue, they're developing, they have language, they'll interact with you. Now at the age of two or three, they completely shut down. Mm -hmm. They lose all language, they regress. And time and time again, the parents say, my child has just become a shell. It's just one of the most traumatic things that can happen. If your child is born like that, that's what the reality is. But for the reality to switch so quickly or in just in a matter of months, mm -hmm. we're trying to subtype that. I honestly believe that the cure for many types of autism exists. They're just languishing on someone's shelf because they were trying for a completely different disease. So now we're trying to repurpose some, some microbiome drugs that were tried for GI disorders. But we find the same pathway. So why not, if it's helping your GI condition, maybe it will help an autistic child even without the GI condition mm -hmm. because of the shared pathways. The other thing is absolutely, that's why you know, Sarah's work is so important, to control these exposures, to control these inputs that are under our control. Maybe I'm, a, I'm the type that will always have a hyper inflammatory response, but maybe I can control the input. Right? I can mm -hmm. control the input, then I don't have to have that many instances of that hyper so I just want to, um, I'm sure there are more questions. I have to be out of heat, like cleaned up at 11.30, unfortunately. It should have been 12 o'clock, but I think I'm sure. But um, I just want to assure everybody that um, this conversation can be continued. Um, send me your questions. We'll make sure that you know they get answered. Um, spend the next you know 10 minutes or so, you know, we'll talk with Sarah Manish, um, and you know, uh, there will be follow up. We'll be sending out some new tips that, that everybody can use to, you know, and maybe address some of these things.